Hello, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome back to the podcast. And today I am going to go over my review of AEW's All In. Starting off, we have the Zero Hour. I'm not going to give a full detail of the full lineup of the matches that were on Zero Hour. I'm pretty much going to talk about some of the announcements that were made during the Zero Hour. Now, it was heavily rumored that obviously Tony Khan had a lot of rumors. Well, not rumors, announcements that were coming down the pike here soon for AEW. So some of those announcements were actually made during the Zero Hour. The first announcement that was made was that AEW's Grand Slam will be in Australia next year, 2025. Now, obviously there was a lot of speculation about AEW doing stadium shows going into the new year next year. And Australia was one of the shows. Obviously, Texas as well. Everybody knows by now Texas next year will have all in which is a very big deal. So it looks like Tony Khan is trying to do more stadium shows going into 2025. So it was announced that AEW Grand Slam will be in Australia next year in 2025. This is a big deal for AEW. The other announcement that was made was that AEW's Forbidden Door. Now this pay-per-view is usually, Forbidden Door from what I understand is usually around June. But the Forbidden Door show next year will be in London in August 2025. Now, some people might be like asking why are they going to London for Forbidden Door? I think this has a lot to do with the fact that All In is going to be in Texas next year in the at the Ranger Stadium. It's going to be a big deal, obviously, having All In the first time ever in the States. It's going to be a humongous show, and I'm pretty much predicting that show will be completely sold out next year for All In uh, in Texas. Uh, the Forbidden Door being in London, I think that's the reason why I think they're doing it in London because they're not going to have a show in London next year with All In going over to uh, Texas. So Forbidden Door next year will be in London August 2025. Definitely looking forward to that. All uh, Forbidden Door, again, is one of their biggest shows of the year. Uh, the other thing that happened in Zero Hour that I thought was very interesting was that we had Soraya come down with her entire family. She comes down to the ring, grabs a microphone, pretty much interrupts the show. She says she's the best female wrestler in England, and after that, she was interrupted by the return of Jamie Hayter. Jamie Hayter finally returns after being gone away from AEW for quite some time due to injury. She comes back, and she attacks Soraya, pretty much sending a message to Soraya. This was a great moment, and it was great to see Jamie Hayter come back into the fold for AEW. Moving on from that, we go into our first match of the main card. It is a trios title match, for a uh, ladder match for the trios championships. It is the House of Black versus the Gun Club and Juice Robinson versus Yuta, Claudio, and Pac versus the Patriarchy. I thought it was a good match, man. It was a back and forth matchup with all teams involved with the Patriarchy keeping the pace of the match. Nick Wayne then hits, hits a Wayne, Wayne's World through a table. Yuta and Juice, and Juice both exchange in the middle of the ring with the Guns hitting a 310 to Yuma on Brody King. Claudio then hits a giant swing on Juice Robinson in the middle of the ring with Pac hitting a black arrow off the top rope. Wayne then hits an enziguri. Wayne then hits a tope into a Canadian destroyer on the outside on Malachi Black through a table that looked absolutely brutal. Christian then hits a kill switch on Pac. Christian then jumps off the ladder, hits a spear on Matthews through a table, and then Pac climbs the ladder, grabs the title, and your winners of the match and new AEW Trios champions are Yuta, Claudio, and Pac. Hats off to you, to Claudio and Pac for getting the win in this matchup. Moving on from that, we go into our next match of the night. It is for the AEW Women's Championship. It is Mariah May versus Tony Storm. Uh, number one, I thought Tony Storm's entrance was absolutely awesome. Uh, the match itself was a really good matchup. Back and forth matchup between May and Storm. May and Storm both exchanged in the middle of the ring with Storm keeping the pace of the match. May then hits a powerbomb off the apron on Storm. It looked absolutely brutal. May then quickly attacks Luther ringside. Tony then hits a Storm Zero off the steel steps. Mariah May then hits a hip attack on Tony Storm. Tony then hits a hip attack of her own on May. Tony then hits a Storm Zero for a near fall. May then hits a low blow with the referee being distracted. May then hits a May Day for a near fall, but then May hits another Storm Zero on Tony Storm. Pins her for the three, and your winner of the match and new AEW Women's Champion is Mariah May. Hats off to Mariah May for getting the win in that matchup. Moving on from that, we go into our next match of the night. It is for the FTW Championship. It is Hook versus Chris Jericho. Um, before the match even really got started, Jericho had a live performance with his band Fozzy. Uh, Hook also paid homage to his father Taz with his entrance music. Kind of had like the uh, 
old school ECW vibe, if you will. And the match itself was a really good match, man. It was a back and forth matchup between Hook and Jericho with Big Bill and Keith attacking Hook. Jericho then hits a code breaker quickly on Hook as well. Jericho and Hook both exchange in the middle of the ring, with Jericho hitting a lion salt on Hook for a near fall. Hook then attacks Keith and Bill with a cricket bat. Keith then hits Hook with a trash can lid. Jericho then applies the walls of Jericho, but the hold is broken. Hook then applies the walls of Jericho of his own on Jericho, but Bill, Big Bill attacks Hook, breaks the hold. Jericho then hits Hook with a trash can. Jericho then goes to hit Hook, missed, and hit Big Bill. Bill goes through a table, a barbed wire table. Taz then gets involved in the match. He comes off the commentary table. He attacks Brian Keith, which allows Hook to apply a red rum on Jericho. Jericho taps out, and your winner of the match and new FTW champion is Hook. Hats off to Hook for getting the win in this matchup. Moving on from that, we go into our next match of the night. It is a triple threat tag team matchup for the AEW Tag Team Championships. It is FTR versus the Young Bucks versus the Acclaimed. I thought it was a good match, man. It was a back and forth matchup with all teams involved with the Young Bucks keeping the pace of the match. Nick Jackson then hit the springboard Hurricane Rana. FTR then hit a shatter machine for a near fall. Matt and Max Caster hit an EVP trigger. Billy Gunn gets involved. He attacks Matt Jackson. Max then hits a mic drop on Matt. Nick Jackson and his Dax with the title. Matt then hits a roll up. Young Bucks then hit an EVP trigger. Pins for the three. And your winners of the match. And still AW Tag Team Champions are the Young Bucks. After the match, Grizzle Young Veterans show up. They actually stare down the Young Bucks. But they quickly attack FTR. Looks like the Grizzle Young Veterans are sending a message to the Young Bucks. Moving on from that, we go into our next match of the night. It's a casino gauntlet matchup where the winner will receive an AEW title shot of their choosing or when they decide to actually go after the belt. Uh, the first entrant of this match was Orange Cassidy. The second entrant of this match was Okada. The crowd erupted when Okada came out to the ring. It was a good match, back and forth matchup with Okada keeping the pace of the match. Nigel McGinnis is the next entrant. The crowd goes crazy. Nigel and Okada both exchange in the middle of the ring. With Kyle O'Reilly is the next entrant. Orange Cassidy then hits Stun Dog Millionaire. Next entrant is Zack Sabre Jr. Nigel and Zack then both exchange in the middle of the ring with Okada hitting an elbow drop off the top rope. Roderick Strong is the next entrant, as well as Mark Briscoe. Mark then hits a senton off the apron. Adam Page is the next entrant. Page hits a Death Valley driver in the middle of the ring, as well as a fallaway slam on Orange Cassidy. Orange then goes for an orange punch, but Page counters it with a dead eye. Jeff Jarrett is the next entrant. Jarrett and Page both exchange in the middle of the ring. And after that, the next entrant is newly signed AEW superstar Ricochet. He ends up showing up. Ricochet then hits a springboard shooting star press. Cage is the next entrant. Page hits a buckshot lariat on Ricochet for a near fall. Jared hits Page with a guitar shot that looked absolutely brutal. Okada then hits a rainmaker on Jared. Jared's laid out in the middle of the ring. Orange then hits an orange punch on Okada. Roderick then hits an end of heartache. Cage hits a spear on McGinnis. Luchasaurus is here. Luchasaurus then hits a choke slam on O'Reilly. Cage then goes for the cover. Pins for the three. And your winner of the match. And the person earning a title shot for an AEW title, world title, is Cage, uh, Christian Cage. Hats off to Christian Cage for getting the win in this matchup. Moving on from that, we go into our next match of the night. It's one of the high-profile matches of all in. It is Will Ospreay versus MJF for the international title. Uh, before the match even got started, man, the Ospreay entrance was absolutely awesome. Pretty much paying homage to Assassin's Creed. Uh, the video package was great. The whole stage production was awesome for Osprey coming out to the match. Uh, the match itself was a great match. It was a back and forth matchup between Osprey and MJF, with Osprey and MJF both exchanging in the middle of the ring. Osprey then hits Moonsault to the outside, taking out MJF. MJF then gets up, hits a kangaroo kick on Osprey. Osprey then hits a springboard forearm, taking out MJF. Osprey then hits a handspring Pele kick as well. MJF then gets up, hits a tombstone pile driver on Osprey to the outside. It looked absolutely brutal. But Osprey gets up, hits a Spanish fly on the outside. Osprey hits a springboard shooting star press as well. MJF then hits a crossroads for a near fall. Osprey gets up, hits an Oz cutter for a near fall, as well as another Oz cutter off the top rope. MJF then hits a pile driver for a near fall. Osprey then gets up, hits a storm breaker for a near fall. MJF then hits a Panama sunrise off the apron. It looked absolutely brutal. Osprey then gets up, he hits an Oz cutter off the apron. Osprey then goes for a hidden blade, but missed and hit the cameraman. It looked absolutely brutal. He decimated that cameraman. Osprey then goes for a hidden blade, but MJF 
hits Osprey with the title. MJF then hits a brain buster for a near fall. Osprey then goes for a Tyler driver, but MJF hits a low blow. Garcia is here. He ends up attacking MJF, which allows Osprey to hit another hidden blade on MJF. Osprey then hits a devastating Tyler driver on MJF, pins him for the three. And your winner of the match is Will Osprey. After the match, Christopher Daniels hands over the international title back over to Will Ospreay. Looks like the American Championship is no more, and AEW is going to continue with the international title. A couple of things I want to talk about with this matchup, man. This was a great match. It was a great moment for the fans. Uh, like I said, the entrance with Ospreay was awesome, obviously paying a little homage to Ass uh, Assassin's Creed. Uh, just the whole stage setup for that was awesome. The video package was great. Obviously, Osprey bringing a, being a big fan of the Assassin's Creed video game, um, this was great. Osprey, you know, he's one of those guys, man. That since they brought him in, he's a workhorse for AEW. He's he's definitely a star and a future world champion for AEW. And uh, this was a great match, man. It told a hell of a story between MJF and Osprey, and uh, the build up towards this match leading up to All In, man, was just absolutely incredible. But uh, incredible. But hats off to Osprey. For getting the win in this matchup. Moving on from that, we go into our next match of the night. It's for the TBS title. It is Mercedes Monet defending the TBS title against Britt Baker. Uh, I thought Monet's entrance was awesome. It was a good match, back and forth matchup between Monet and Baker, with Monet keeping the pace of the match. Monet then pays homage to Eddie Guerrero by hitting the three amigos on Baker. Baker then fall uh, falls, uh, ends up attacking Camille. Camille then uh, gets ejected from the match due to the fact that Baker fell, symbolizing if Camille hit her with the championship. Referee throws out Camille. Baker then hits a Panama Sunrise on Monet, but Monet hits a money maker on Baker, pins her for the three, and your winner of the match and still TBS champion is Mercedes Monet. Hats off to Mercedes Monet for getting the win in this matchup. Moving on from that, we go into our next match of the night. It's for the TNT Championship in, in a coffin match. It is Jack Perry defending the TNT title against Darby Allen. I thought this was a fantastic match. Back and forth matchup between Perry and Allen with Darby keeping the pace of the match. Perry then brings out a bag of broken glass. Fans then mock CM Punk, which I thought was absolutely hilarious. Darby then hits a coffin drop. Perry then throws Darby off the stage. It looked absolutely brutal. Perry then puts Darby in a body bag. He pretty much drags him down the ramp to the coffin. Perry then hits a running knee, ends up closing the lid on Darby Allen, and your winner of the match is Jack Perry. After the match, the Young Bucks come down to the ring carrying a gas can. They pour the gas on the coffin, but then the lights go out. Fans start going crazy, and all of a sudden, Sting ends up showing up. Sting comes down to the ring. He attacks the Elite and saves Darby Allen. A couple of things I want to talk about with this, man. Number one, this was a great match. Uh, this was the first coffin match that Darby Allen has lost since he's been with AEW. Uh, but it told a hell of a story, man. Obviously, what Jack Perry's done since he's been back with AEW, I think he's done a fantastic job with the scapegoat character. I, I, to me, I don't think him ever going back to the Jungle Boy character is even a possibility at this point. I think what he's done with the Elite and what he's doing right now as a heel is some of the best work Jack Perry has done in his AEW career. Uh, but the, the biggest wild card in his, I would have to say, is Sting. You know, seeing I know Sting said that he was going to be watching, but you don't know where he was going to be watching from during this matchup between Darby Allen and Jack Perry. And seeing Sting show up and come down to save Darby Allen, what does this, you know, my the biggest question mark is, is this a one-off for Sting? And to me, I don't really know. I, do I think Sting's in-ring career is done? Yeah, I, I do. I think there's nothing else more for Sting to do as far as wrestling professionally right now. He's done everything in his career, and as his career is probably the one of the best careers of all time, in my honest opinion. Uh, and what he's done when he revamped his career coming into AEW and going out the way that he did, I mean, I don't think there's going to be another legend in professional wrestling that's going to go out in the retirement kind of like how Sting did. Sting's retirement was awesome. You know, having his family involved with his two sons and, and being – in a tag team match with his protege being Darby Allen. It was just a great moment at Revolution when, you know, Sting had his last match. The video package uh, showing, you know, some of Sting's old school moments, if you will, times that he had over in New Japan, matches he had with Great Muda, stuff like that, and uh, what he did over in Japan and what he's done in AEW. I don't think there's really going to be that many people that are going to match uh, what Tony Khan did for AEW, uh, for what Tony Khan did for Sting's last match in AEW, his retirement match. But 
It's a big question mark to me, man. Is this something where Sting is going to come back? Um, I know it's been talked about that Sting was going to be, you know, kind of lingering around for AEW. I know that he wanted to be a part of AEW's all-in show next year as well. So I don't know if this is something where, you know, we're going to see Sting in a manager kind of role possibly or just kind of be hanging around Darby Allen, you know, kind of watching his back, if you will, dealing with Jack Perry and the Elite. This is something where this might be something where we bring Sting back into the fold a little bit in the aspect of keeping an eye on Darby Allen. So, again, still yet to be seen what's going to happen. Hopefully we get some kind of information from Darby Allen of what they're going to do moving forward with Sting. But I don't think this will be the last time that we ever see Sting again in AEW. Uh, moving on from that, we go into our main event of All In. It is title versus career, man. It is Brian Danielson versus Swerve Strickland. Uh, before the match even got started, man, it was a great video package showing Brian Danielson um, and just hyping up this matchup between himself and Swerve Strickland. The match itself was a fantastic match. Back and forth matchup between Danielson and Swerve. You have Danielson's family in the crowd watching on. Danielson then hits a springboard senton to the outside, taking out Strickland. Danielson and Strickland both exchanged in the middle of the ring with Strickland hitting a Death Valley driver on the apron using the ring bell. It looked absolutely brutal. Swerve then hits a foot stomp in front of Brian Danielson's family. That looked absolutely brutal. Swerve then hits a rolling flatliner for a near fall. Danielson then lands multiple yes kicks on Swerve. Swerve then hits a swerve stomp. Swerve then hits three house calls on Danielson for a near fall. Danielson applies a triangle choke on Swerve, but Swerve breaks the hold. Danielson then hits a running knee. Swerve gets up, hits another house call on Danielson. Adam Page is here. Page is trying to get to Swerve, but he is stopped by security. This allows Danielson to hit another running knee on Swerve for a near fall. Danielson then hits another running knee, and then Danielson applies a label lock on Swerve. Swerve taps out, and your winner of the match and new AEW World Champion is Brian Danielson. Hats off to Brian Danielson for getting the win in this matchup. A couple of things that I want to talk about, man, when it pertains to All In. And I know it's something that people are going to be asking me about. You know, when I when I told you guys for AEW and All In, Tony Khan needed to hit a grand slam coming into All In. Do I think that he did that? Not entirely. But what I will say is that he hit a couple home runs for sure. Uh, there were some very good moments about All In, and there were some moments that were kind of like, eh, I don't know. Uh, number one, where I was kind of like, I don't know, was the return of Jamie Hayter. Uh, Jamie Hayter coming back on the zero hour, to me, made no sense at all. And to me, this was something where, you know, I, I don't know the situation with Soraya. I, I know a lot of people are saying, or pointing the, at Soraya, saying that she might be leaving AEW and possibly going back over to WWE. I don't know if that's going to happen or not. I, this might be, you know, something legitimate that she might have an issue with Tony Khan and AEW where she wants to leave because she's not being utilized correctly in her eyes. I don't know. Um, but Soraya and Jamie Hayter, I don't know how that kind of fits into the, into the fold. I know the whole stipulation was that, you know, Soraya came out at Wembley and said she was the best female wrestler from England, and then Jamie Hayter comes out and pretty much attacks her family as well as Soraya. I get that. Um... But there was other ways to me that you could have brought in Jamie Hayter. And one of the biggest things I said even before All In was knowing that Mercedes Monet had the muscle being with Camille. Uh, this would have been great to see Baker come out and then she is joined by Jamie Hayter. And Hayter has Britt Baker's back during this matchup between herself and Monet for the TBS title. That would be more, to me, realistic of bringing Jamie Hayter back. I know some people might be against that because, oh, it might outshine the matchup between Monet and Baker, but at the same time, too, I feel like it adds more to the matchup between Baker and Monet because, to be honest with you, up until the last week, the the segments between Monet and Baker were kind of at a stalemate until the week prior to All In. Um, the storyline just it, it wasn't really there for me personally, uh, in my opinion, but... I feel like if you would have brought in Jamie Hayter during this matchup, it would have added more you know, fuel to that fire, if you will, between the Baker and Monet matchup with Hayter having Baker's back and keeping her safe away from Camille. I think that would have been a better way to bring back or have a return of Jamie Hayter in that aspect. But there was a lot of also good with this show, too. The other negative, I will say, and I didn't know how they were going to portray this, was Ricochet. I'm glad Ricochet is in AEW. I really am. I did a review, uh, a news and rumor video for you guys about Ricochet signing a multi-year deal with AEW. And I told you guys that I think he will have a tremendous career in AEW. I know some people 
there's a few people probably out there that says, oh, well, he's going to get lost in the shuffle. You know, it's nothing really new with Ricochet, blah, 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 yada, yada, yada. At the end of the day, does his style of wrestling fit AEW? Absolutely. Is it a good addition to the roster? Absolutely. You know, I believe he has a match this week up in, uh, this week on Dynamite against Kyle Fletcher. I think it's going to be a really, really good matchup. I think Ricochet is going to have a great home in AEW. Um, how he fits into the fold, we don't know. A lot of people said the same thing about Osprey when he came into AEW or Takeshita or uh, Okada. Now, I'm not sitting here saying that they both have great careers right now, but Os- Osprey's been on fire, in my, opi- in my opinion, since he's been with AEW. Okada, <clears throat> I mean, I'm not going to say Okada's on fire, but at the same time, too, he is the cur- current Continental Champion right now. So it's not like they don't have really any plans with Okada. And Okada is obviously tied with the Elite right now. So he's going to be shown on TV a lot, or at least a decent amount uh, moving forward with him being tied to Matt and Nick Jackson and being a part of the Elite. That's going to happen. Osprey is the current international champion right now. And there's no way you're not going to see Osprey on television. I think Ricochet is on the same boat. I think there's a lot of matches on the table for Ricochet to have in AEW that are going to be barn burner matches, man. Absolute bangers. And I'm definitely looking forward to that. The only downside I would say about that, I think the other way that I would have debuted Ricochet was have him come out at the end of the match between Osprey and MJF. Ricochet comes out to seem like he was going to congratulate Osprey for his matchup and winning the belt, and then he turns heel and attacks Will Osprey, setting up that storyline between Ricochet and Will Osprey. Even though I know Pac is going to be challenging Will Osprey at All Out for the international title, but they can also take that Ricochet stuff and build that story between Osprey and Ricochet, probably leading into Russell Dream, to be honest with you. So, I mean, there's other ways that, that you can look at it in that aspect. So, I think those are the two things that I might say of negative about All In is the fact that they could have done different with Jamie Hayter as well as Ricochet, as far as bringing her back from injury and having Ricochet debut in AEW. That's my only negative I will say about All In. The other, but the, the positives about All In, and there's a lot. Do I think this all-in surpassed last year's all-in? Yes, I do. I I think storyline-based and the build leading up to all-in, just the entire package of all-in, it told a hell of a story leading into this year's all-in compared to last year. Um, Obviously, you know, you got the Casino Gauntlet match. You have the storyline with MJF and Will Ospreay. told a hell of a story. And Adam Page. Adam Page was a wild card throughout this entire event. You know, Page said that he wants to go into the Casino Gauntlet match that he was going to win it. Unfortunately, that did not happen. And then seeing Adam Page a part of the main event and trying to attack Swerve or get to attack Swerve and then being stopped by AEW security, that right there is trying to tie up the storyline here between Page and Swerve, which this will all come to fruition at All Out because it's already been planned and booked that it will be Swerve versus Adam Page in some kind of matchup at All Out, which I'm definitely looking forward to it because those two gentlemen, every time they're in a ring against each other, they tear the house down. We all saw the match that happened between them at, I believe, Full Gear, which was an absolute incredible banger match. And I feel like we're going to get the same thing, possibly, at All Out in September. So pretty much in a week or two. So I'm definitely looking forward to that. Um, But, you know, Tony Khan, AEW did a hell of a job this time with continuing storylines and creating storylines even after this pay-per-view. So I will give credit where credit is due. Tony Khan... Definitely hit a couple home runs when it pertained to All In. Do I think it was a grand slam? No. And the reason why I don't think it's a grand slam, and it might be a, you know a hot topic for most people and a hard pill to swallow, but just bear me out. Let's hear me out for a second. The reason why I don't believe it was a grand slam is because there's other ways they could have went about it as far as bringing in Jamie Hayter, Ricochet, you know, and other possible free agents to come in to be a part of the Casino Gauntlet match. I'm not sitting here saying that we might not see a Bobby Lashley or Shelton Benjamin or a Hurt Syndicate or anything else like that, but I think there was other ways they could have done it. But the final package that we got with Brian Danielson and Swerve Strickland, that was the moment that told me that Tony Khan is Mr. Pay-Per-View. Tony Khan, when it pertains to pay-per-views or PLEs, whatever you guys want to call it, Tony Khan is the man when it comes to having pay-per-views. Everybody gets excited. The matches are great. There's great moments. And the the Danielson-Swerve match that happened at All In was a hell of a moment, a moment where... Emotions were running high for a lot of fans. Obviously, emotions were running high for Danielson and Swerve, you know, Danielson's family. There was a lot of emotions running wild throughout that match because that would have been, could have been the last time that we've seen Brian Danielson ever wrestling again or even wrestling in AEW. But with that being said, 
with him winning that belt and seeing him, you know, embrace his family and his family embraces Brian Danielson. He's also embraced by Claudio and Wheeler Yuta and Pac. It was a great moment for Brian Danielson. And I think Tony Khan always does a great job by, you know, creating moments and memories for the fans. And I think he hit a, you know, a home run with the Brian Danielson moment with him winning that belt at All In. Um, but with that being said, uh, do I... Do I believe Brian, even though he won that belt, do I believe Brian Danielson's going to have a hell of a run like Swerve did or, you know, long extended championship runs with that belt? No, I do not. I, if you guys watched the <clears throat> the post show with Brian Danielson and when he's sitting there with his family, he even tells Tony Khan and the fans that were at that press conference that, you know, he's ready to go home. Now, do I believe that he's going to go home and run off in the sunset and fully on retire? No, I do not. Do I think he'll work a part-time schedule and remain with AEW? Yes, but I think Danielson is definitely going to take some time off. Where I also believe, and again, don't quote me on this, but I just had this rare belief that Brian Danielson will be, what I heard will be on Dynamite this week to address the fans. Or or say something about All In and address, I guess, his future, if I had to guess. If I had to assume, I, I genuinely believe that Brian Danielson will vacate the AEW title. And he will take some time off. I genuinely believe that. I think Danielson wants to take some time off, spend time with his family, and rightfully so. He definitely deserves it. He's had a hell of a career so far in AEW, in my honest opinion. So I think what's going to happen is, when it comes down to Dynamite, I think there's a very good chance, in my opinion, that Brian Danielson will vacate the AEW World Championship, and he will spend some time at home. I don't see Danielson having a hell of a run with that belt. Do I see Swerve Strickland becoming champion again? Yes, I do. I think Swerve and what he's done with AEW, I know he just re-signed a new contract with AEW. It was shown during the Zero Hour, I believe. Um, and he re-signed his contract with AEW, which is absolutely awesome. And again, Swerve is a workhorse, man. Swerve, I, I can't say enough good things about Swerve, uh, Swerve Strickland. Man. He's done a fantastic job in AEW. He's done a fantastic job defending that AEW title. He's putting on phenomenal matches, banger matches. Uh, for the fans and and Swerve, you know, Swerve still has a lot of potential, man, in AEW. And, and and looking at what Swerve is doing now in AEW compared to what he was doing over in NXT and WWE, my God, is it night and day? It is vastly different of what he was doing compared to WWE and AEW. He's having a hell of a career and a hell of a run in AEW. And I think that run and another championship run is down the pike for Swerve Strickland. It's the only it, to me, honestly, it's the only the beginning for Swerve. I think Swerve has a lot of potential, and he's, he has a very, very high ceiling in AEW, in my honest opinion. And for what he did at All In, uh, and giving, you know, Brian Danielson an opportunity and allowing, you know, putting on a great match for the fans, man, it just pays respect to Swerve and what Swerve means to AEW and what he means for the business. And I think Swerve is one of those guys who's going to be an AEW elitist for a very, very long time. I don't see Swerve going anywhere anytime soon to be honest with you. Um, but yeah, man, I mean, I think when it comes down to it, all in, was it a grand slam? No. But was there a couple home uh, home runs? Absolutely. Absolutely. I'm not going to sit here and be naive and say, oh yeah, all in was terrible. All in sucked. All in was, it was crap. Brian Danielson should have never won the belt. No, that's complete bullshit. I'm not going to sit here and say that. If you, to me, honestly, and, and you know, there's so other people that have said this, and I have to actually agree with them. If you're a pro wrestling fan, and you didn't agree with what happened with Brian Danielson winning that belt last night, then I, I don't know what to tell you. You're not a wrestling fan, man, to be honest with you. With all due respect to Swerve Strickland, I, I have the utmost respect for that man. He is a great wrestler. He's a great athlete. He's a great world champion. But if you, as a fan, were not going crazy and emotions running high after Brian Danielson ended up tapping out Swerve to become the new AEW world champion, if there was no emotions running through your body at that time when he won that belt. I don't know what to tell you, man. Myself, my wife included, we were ecstatic. We were completely happy because, for me personally, I followed Brian Danielson's career for a very long time, watching him in Ring of Honor. What he's done, obviously, in WWE, and made a name for himself, a humongous name for himself, working with WWE. And what he's done with AEW, man, has just been a hell of a journey and a hell of a story. And, and to watch him win that belt and see him, you know, embrace his family after that matchup, and you have, you know, Pac and Claudio and Yuta embracing. Uh, my, uh, Brian Danielson after this win. It was a great moment. And the Wembley fans, man, my God. The fans over in England at Wembley were amazing. Absolutely amazing fans. 
the crowd was great. The crowd was live, you know, and the crowd was doing everything they could to keep the fans invested in these matchups. And, you know, seeing Brian Danielson come out to the ring with the final countdown and the fans just erupted, it was just a hell of a moment for Brian Danielson. So to me, yeah, all in, this was the best all in that we've seen so far. In my honest opinion, and that might be a stretch and a hot take for most people, but I'm I'm looking at it purely based on storyline leading up to All In and even creating storylines after All In. Having Adam Page come in in this main event trying to attack Swerve, this is building another storyline here between Swerve and Page leading, leading up to All Out. It was a great moment, man. And seeing Danielson's family there, you see Bree and, and Danielson's family there, it was just a great moment. It was a fantastic moment, and Tony Khan did a fantastic job in handling this situation between Swerve and Brian Danielson and having Danielson walk out as AEW World Champion. But like I said, I to me genuinely believe, I genuinely believe that, you know, Danielson will not have a long run with the belt. I uh, p- personally, in my in my honest opinion, I can see Brian Danielson vacating that belt on Dynamite. And there'll be another tournament or something like that to crown a new champion. And we go from there. I, I just I think Danielson's not going to fully retire. I just think he's going to take some time off. I think he might re-sign with AEW if he hasn't already done so. And it's going to be more of a part-time basis for Brian Danielson. But I don't see Danielson going anywhere anytime soon. I just I don't see that. It was a great moment for Danielson, but I don't think it was the way that Danielson really wanted to go out in his career, his own way, in my opinion. Even though if that's the case, it is a hell of a way to go out, to go out as world champion and to retire. And it, that could be the case. But to, in my opinion, I don't see Danielson going anywhere anytime soon. I think he's going to be done working a full-time schedule. And then he's going to you know, re-sign a contract with AEW if he already hasn't done so and be a part-time wrestler. That, To me, that's what the most logical thing in my head that I can think of for Brian Danielson. Because I just don't see him leaving right now <clears throat> with everything he's done with AEW. I just, I do not see it. But it was a great night, man. I mean, I, like I said, it, it's... Did we see a Shane McMahon? No. Did we see a Bobby Lashley and the Hurt Syndicate? No. But did we see Ricochet? Yeah. Did we see Jamie Hayter return? Yes. Did we see? I know some people were saying, "Oh, we should have saw Becky Lynch." I to be I, to, to, honestly with you, like for people that want Becky Lynch over to AEW, you really have to look at the logistics of everything, man. I do not see Becky Lynch or AKA Re- Rebecca Quinn going over to AEW. I I'd be very very shocked. I was I, I can see Shane McMahon walking through AEW before Becky Lynch, hands down, for abundance of reasons. Obviously, WWE doesn't want anything to do with Shane, and Shane's already had conversations and talks with current AEW talent as well as the owner and CEO, Tony Khan, in a private meeting in Texas. So I could definitely see Shane walking through that door well before Becky even puts a toe in the door at this point. The Hurt Business or the Hurt Syndicate, I mean... My standpoint has been the same. I can see Bobby Lashley and the Hurt Syndicate showing up in AEW, but I can also see him be a big part of TNA. Bobby Lashley and MVP have had a career working over in TNA, and I think it would also benefit them to work with TNA. I'm not opposed against that. Not everybody has to go to AEW. And I think AEW fans need to realize that just because they're free agent doesn't necessarily mean, oh man, they got to go to AEW. No. They can go to New Japan, they can go to TNA. They can go to NWA if they decide to choose to. I don't know why they would. With all due respect to the fans of NWA Power, just saying, I think financially they couldn't really do that much with some of the independent talent that's out there right now. I know damn well they could not afford a Becky Lynch right now. I'm sorry. With all due respect to Mr. Corgan and NWA Power and what they're doing over there, there's no shot in hell that he can afford a talent like Becky Lynch. No way. And I think Bobby Lashley's on the same page. I know there's some talent out there that are like, oh, I don't understand why Bobby Lashley doesn't side with NWA. I mean, look at the catalog, man. This is not 1970s. This ain't the 1960s. This ain't the 1980s. This is not, you know, it's, it's definitely changed. I, I respect, don't get me wrong, I respect what Billy Corgan is trying to do with the NWA and what he's, you know, trying to revamp the brand. I know, obviously, they're going to do the independent circuit and, you know, go out to scout other regions and stuff like that to kind of have them under the NWA banner. I respect that. And given, you know, independent shows and independent talent and opportunity at the NWA world title, I'm all for that. But I'm looking at it from a financial standpoint. I understand, yeah, they're on the CW Network. I, I get that. I understand that. But not a lot of people have the CW Network. It's a TV company that's just not a predominant TV company. Um, and to me, I, I 
with all due respect, I don't see NWA being a viable product at this point. I, I just don't. And I, it's not just NWA. I feel the same thing about Ring of Honor. I don't see Ring of Honor really being a viable product right now. You can rebrand it AW Ring of Honor. It's not going to mean a damn thing to me because to me, Ring of Honor is just, it's not the same as it once was. And I've already talked about this. Ring of Honor back in the day before Tony Khan had purchased the company, this was something where a lot of independent talent or talent from all over the world came over to Ring of Honor and put on banger matches for the fans that fans never thought they would see. You know, obviously talent from New Japan, talent from Ring of Honor, talent from uh, other independent companies, t- talent from Mexico that come over to the Ring of Honor. I mean, a lot of great superstars have made a name for themselves working with Ring of Honor, and those names that, that I know of include of Sami Zayn, Kevin Owens, Seth Rollins, uh, and Brian Danielson. You know, just to name a few that's worked with Ring of Honor that have made great names for themselves and made a career just working out of Ring of Honor. And it's not the same anymore. Not a lot of people have a lot of, you know, investment, if you will, into what Ring of Honor is doing anymore. It's not the same brand. It's not the same company anymore. But despite that, like I said, do I think All In hit a grand slam? No. But it hit a couple home runs. We obviously get the debut of Ricochet. We get the return of Jamie Hayter. We get that great moment with Brian Danielson beating Swerve Strickland and becoming a new AEW World Champion. We have Darby Allen and Jack Perry with, I wouldn't call it a return, but a moment where Sting comes back since his retirement match to help out Darby Allen. And again, there's a lot of question marks that go into that. You know, is Sting going to be lingering around Darby Allen and kind of mentoring Darby or, you know, kind of watching Darby's back? And, you know, we'll see what happens, man. I think Sting... I don't believe this will be the last time we see Sting in AEW. I, I, I genuinely don't feel that. I, I think we're going to see Sting again. It's not a matter of where, but when. That's that's the main thing. I I think that's what it comes down to. I don't think we, this is the last time we saw Sting. Sting looks absolutely great. Looks like he hasn't lost a beat, even since his retirement match. And I'm all for to see Sting come back in AEW in some kind of capacity. Absolutely. I think Sting does miss it. I know Sting's son is also training with Darby Allen to become a professional wrestler. So Sting still wants to have involvement with professional wrestling. And I'm all for it. I have no problem with Sting wants to walk back to that AEW door in some kind of capacity and be a part of AEW. Ain't going to have no arguments out of me from that. I think Sting's done a hell of a job in his career. And he's done a hell of a job in AEW. Absolutely. And I would not mind seeing Sting come back in AEW. But... Like I said, man, this wasn't a grand slam for AEW, but it was a couple home runs for All In. And to me, honestly, it was one of the best All In's AEW's ever put together, in my honest opinion. Just based on story, based on presentation, based on the entire package of what All In brought to the table, to me, in my honest opinion, this was the best All In show that AEW has possibly put together so far. But with that being said, this is my review of AEW's All In. I hope you guys are out there staying safe. Be careful and remember...